Today on Mild vs. Wild, I've got $15,000 and I've got $30,000. And we're both building six, seven power stroke engines. So we came to Bolivar, Tennessee to visit Cho Engineering Performance. This is Mild vs. Wild, horsepower at any cost. Cass started Cho Engineering Performance in 2013, and he's been going strong for almost a decade. The shop started in Whiteville, Tennessee in a 7,500 square foot space, and it saw immediate growth thanks to excellent machine work, repair and maintenance work, full engine builds, and parts manufacturing for all three of the light duty diesel platforms. A few years ago, the shop got to a point where more space was needed, so Cass relocated Cho Engineering Performance to Bolivar and a 155,000 square foot shop space. The shop's dedication to quality engine work, its growth, its machining capabilities, and its impact in the diesel industry all made Choate Engineering Performance well-deserving of Engine Builders 2022 America's Best Diesel Engine Shop Award. So that's a little bit about the shop, but we're here to get some 6.7 Power Stroke engines built. Again, our mild budget is $15,000 and our wild budget is $30,000, which both should make for some solid builds. Once we break down what goes into each build, we'll compare them for total horsepower, horsepower output per dollar, competitiveness, drivability, reliability, and ease of upgrading to see what build comes out on top. So let's go talk with Cass. Oh man, check this out. That's huge. That's a sweet shot. Big operation. Check, check this out. Pretty cool 6.7 right here. That's exactly what we wanted. Hey, yeah. Cass. Hey, Cass. Hey, Greg. Cass, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you, buddy. I see you've been introduced to my kids' retirement fund. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's a hell of an engine. We've uh, we built a lot of 6.7 power strokes. Been very blessed, thank the Lord, that uh, it's been a great platform for us. A lot of things you can do with it, so. Yeah, well, I'm definitely excited to talk through our two builds with you. Yeah. You know, we've never been here at the shop, you know, since you guys have been in the new place, and I uh, would love to see you around. Definitely big, 150,000 plus square feet. It's a huge difference from the last shop. We went from 7,500 square feet to 155,000. My little kid rides his go-kart around here. <laughs> nice. That's a big difference. So, yeah, I mean, pretty good go-kart track, right? It's, it's a great go-kart track. If we you know, can't make it in the engine business, we'll just open a putt-putt golf and there have a go-kart track, yeah. yeah. Yeah, let's show you around. All right, cool. So everything kind of starts at teardown. Okay. So. Naturally. Yeah. Might as well head there first. All right, that's perfect. perfect. All right. So I'll take you back to the back where yeah. kind of everything starts. The interesting thing about Teardown is it tells stories. There's hundreds of stories that can be told if you listen closely, right? Yeah. Yeah. Parts always tell what happened. So everything that you see as it comes in uh, starts getting torn down here and it gets inspected. Um, each engine gets inspected yeah. so that um, we can... Uh, Kind of see what the cause of failure was it teaches us a lot um, first and foremost it teaches us how to serve the customer better because if we can tell them what the cause of failure was with this initial engine um, let's say if you had a melted piston or whatever it was we right. can definitely tell them how to have this next engine live a long and happy life yeah uh, but also gives us an an insight into uh, as far as what's failing what we can do in the aftermarket world so that's what's going on here so we do a lot of different things we do vapor honing shopping furnace uh, parts wash, um, so there's a lot of different processes that we uh, that we use for, yeah. for cleaning. So um, everything gets inspected through here, so we can give that information, that feedback to the customer. So a lot of guys, you know, send their engine oil off or type of analysis to find out what you know how much contamination is in right. the oil, fuel, whatever. Right. Um, obviously, nobody likes an engine failure. It's very expensive, but if we can recover as much information off of that failure as we possibly can we can ensure that the next engine lives a long and happy life. Yeah. So that's something that a lot of times gets missed, I think, because guys really don't, I mean, it's tear down, just yank it apart, go on to the next thing, get it clean, get it into production. Right, and they're, there's, they're missing certain things if they're not taking a more careful look, right? That's right. Yeah. And there's, it's screaming, look, this is why I died. <laughs> yeah. Help me. <laughs> uh, so, you know, it's kind of like the sixth sense, you know, you're trying to figure out and put all these pieces together, you know. But, sure, sure. Uh, but anyhow, so, our balancing department, um, obviously if anything gets done with the stroke in the pistons because the block gets decked for whatever reason. This area over here is our, our block department. Okay. 
So right now he's setting up tail stock. He's going to start boring some blocks again. Um, as you can see, we do all different types, all trifecta of the, the Ford Chevrolet Dodge type thing. So here's our line hone block machining, and then obviously the uh, block honing. Yeah. So Cass, I, I noticed you got you know Cummins, Power Stroke, and Duramax stuff. You know, what's the process for having the blocks come through the department? Is it you know first in first out or you know how do you guys do it a lot of the guys that are that are running diesel trucks are guys that are business owners yeah so if their trucks down and sitting they're not making any money um, it would probably be a lot easier for us as far as production goes to run a block of cummins or a block of six sevens or whatever it might be uh, but we want to be able to service the customer as best we possibly can right. uh, keeping them from being down any more than what they have to absolutely have to be. Yeah. Um, so that's the reason why we take it as it comes. So our turnaround times are, are much lower that way. So instead of waiting yeah. for six engines to come in and waiting on that sixth one to get here, you know, uh, or be sold or whatever, right. we're just gonna take it as it comes. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. Yep. So this is another six, seven power stroke. As you'll see one thing about this, it's a brand new block. Um, something interesting about it is, is that we do not use the same specifications that the factory Ford block does we found some things that were uh insufficient sure and so we address that even though it's a brand new block it's going to get machined awesome so, yeah. yeah awesome yeah i'll take you on to the head department this is our cylinder head department um it's a larger area uh, of course there's seems like it's always the hang up in any type of production environment seems like there's a lot to be done in the cylinder head department yeah. um this is kind of the flow of everything right uh, it starts in and and you know, all the guides get disposed of, taken out. Um, new guides are, are placed in and they're honed and it follows down through a sequence of order um, through the SG-80 and the SG-9. We have five axis um, porting capabilities. So we can actually digitize cylinder heads and test on our Superflow bench um, for, uh, for performance gains. And that's kind of the way of uh, a flow for the head department. Yeah. And then you know, obviously there's a little bit of difference between doing something on a Cummins and then Duramax and Power Stroke because you got double the heads on those guys. You know, how, how does it work in this? Uh, is it any different than what we saw in the block department? Yeah, every head gets something done differently. So our main theme and motto is stock is not an option. What we want is to fix the OE problem. Um, performance gains, absolutely. But longevity, reliability, and then performance. Um, so that's what our customers want. They want to know, you know, Cummins has a motto, Cummins every time. Um, but there's a reason for that. We want consistency in our product. The same thing that we look into machining is repeatability and, and, and consistency um, for, for, for a um, quality product. That's the same thing we're looking here. Uh, so to get back to your, what you're saying is certain cylinder heads have certain problems. Um, it might be a Cummins that a valve seat is notorious for failing and dropping out because there wasn't enough press at a factory. Yeah. So we're going to address that differently than what we might do in, say, a Duramax that does not have that same issue. Um, so we address each cylinder head uh, as its own entity and its own problem. Yeah. So, Very good. Very good. Yeah. So we'll go ahead and walk this way. I told you about my little boy yeah. using the uh, go-kart. This right. place is a go-kart uh, track. So uh, his little sister there has uh, her ride. She parks <laughs> it anywhere. Can't really get her to park in the lines, though. Yeah. Priority parking, right? That's right. <laughs> well, I like see if she owns a place or something. So we'll step over here and I will show you. Uh, there's two sections right now for assembly that we have. Um, you know, we talked about bringing in here while Pat is working on an engine here. He's assembling a Cummins. Um, like certain things that we know that are failures for these blocks. Yeah. You know, Cummins freeze plugs all the time. They're blowing out. All our engines, uh, go ahead, we machine this in-house. Um, so we've got freeze plugs on both sides, uh, billet freeze plugs that are, that are bolted in so we don't have to worry about yeah. the customer you know, having an issue later. So this is assembly section here. Um, we also have assembly se section, uh, actually uh, a couple of other stations, but um, yeah. one of them deals with just full runners. Once the block's completed, it moves, it moves from here into the next station okay. uh, and it'll get finished out. Behind me, um, as you can see, there's basically four different stages of the engine. So we have a long block, yeah. right? Yeah. And then uh, both the Cummins and a 6.7. We have a short block and that would be a complete right. full runner. Right. Um, so depending on what all that engine's getting, that's where it gets built at. So, yeah. Yeah. Very cool. And do you happen to know sort of the breakdown of, you know, how many complete builds you get versus just having a short block or the long block? 
So the thing that we're, the pattern that we're actually starting to see is it's getting harder and harder, especially since COVID, everybody knows to find people, right? Um, it's never been any different with mechanics. Mechanics are a very rare commodity. That seems like it's very tough to find a good mechanic. So because of that, uh, what we've seen is, you know, short blocks, there's a lot of companies that will not sell a short block because of the warranty claims that actually happen on that engine. Yeah. Uh, there's so many ways to screw it up. Nobody wants to take that risk. So they only sell you a long block. While we do have uh, certain engines and certain platforms, 6.4 Power Stroke specifically, uh, we want to sell that as a complete because there's so many ways to, to mess it up. Yeah. We are seeing an influx in the, uh, the complete engines because it's harder and harder to find those guys. It, it makes our life a lot easier. We can just send you something, drop it in, yep. you know, plug it in, crank it up, drive away. So that cuts down on a lot of the headache and frustration for customers when they're trying to find the buddy to do it or yeah. a good shop to do it, which is... Yeah, and like you said, it leaves less variables for you guys because you know you did it A to Z. So. Yeah. yeah, we Very can good. test it. I always say that quality control stops at the dock door. And unfortunately, that's going to be the case anytime that you know, you're dealing with uh, an, a product that's only... In, in, it's incomplete, you know? Yeah. Uh, so if we can make that complete, then we can make our lives a lot easier. In the yeah. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and go to the parts department. All right. Take you down there and um, yeah. show you around what's going on there. So what we, uh, we have here is uh, all the parts and components that we need uh, to, to keep, obviously, our, our line going. But what a lot of people don't realize is that we also sell parts online and we have um, kind of e-commerce, yeah. so okay. because we're able to buy in such bulk, we're able to pass that on to the customer. Yeah. Um, because you know we build, we build 600, 700 engines a year, yeah. Uh, so that makes it really nice so that customers can get the same discount. Yeah, yeah, that's a lot of parts. So. Yeah, awesome. yeah, for sure. So, like I told you before, um, you know, Ford sent us an ice cream machine. Yeah. So, <laughs> uh, that's you got to do something special for it. That's right. Yeah, right. It's a lot of parts. So there you go. We'll head on to the service department now. Okay. The service department um, is kind of where we do a lot of the, uh, it allows us and forces us to do some R&D stuff. So uh, one of the trucks that we've got hanging in the air over here today is going to be uh, a 6.7 power stroke. And that'll kind of be the center focal point of what we're, we're going to be dealing with. Um, yeah. So kind of show you that and what's going on there. And Cass, how many bays do you guys, you know, how many trucks can you get in here at one time? Well, um, you know, you probably could fit somewhere between 75, 80 trucks at a time. Wow. Um, we don't have to actually park any customers yeah. outside, so that makes it really nice. Uh, as far as the bays go, working on bays, um, you know, 10 to 12. Okay. You know, so, but yeah. yeah, there's a lot of room for that. That's great. So. Yeah, very cool. And uh, outside of engine work, you guys clearly get into some other stuff with the full yeah. truck and whatnot. We completely do. Um, a lot of guys come in and they might want, you know, anything from a lift kit to um, upgraded parts. So we definitely do that. Uh, our market is, is heavily into, uh, the guys in our market definitely are, are all about uh, their trucks and, and their, their, their abilities. We'll, we'll call it that, yeah. performance yeah. abilities. Great. Well, Cass, you're teasing that this is going to be a 6.7, and you know we're, we're talking about 6.7s. Yeah. Uh, now that we've seen the full shop, how about we uh, walk through some of these mild and, and wild builds we're, we're going to Absolutely. be talking about? Okay, that yeah. sounds great. Cool. Well, we'll head up front. So, Cass, to reiterate, Greg kind of has the wild build around $30,000. I'm, I'm doing a you know lesser mild build, ten to 15000 and obviously there's going to be a lot less machining done for an engine like that. Uh, we got a couple flywheels here, but why don't you walk us through some of the parts and you know the differences between those two builds? For sure. Well, um, on this particular build, for the wild build and for the mild build, um, what we consider your mild build is going to be around 600 horsepower. Um, that's going to be um, a what, what our brand for that or our model for that is is a, a workhorse, um, and the workhorse engine and the the cask watch actually both come with billet flex plates. So that's a major upgrade. So it's it's equal there. So to kind of give you an idea, uh, this is what our factory would come with, the stamped flex plate. Right. And you can feel how light that is, right? Um, now this is a second op. We haven't finished this and it'll be machined out. But this is a solid billet piece of steel. Um, and it starts life. And if you want to come over here, I'll show you. It actually starts life over here. 
has a, a solid block oh, yeah. right there. Yeah. So that's what your first operation would actually look like right here. Um, so once that gets finished, our second ops uh, are getting cut on the lathe right now and they'll come out looking like uh, the flex plate that we just showed you. Okay. So that makes it a, a lot stronger. You don't have to worry about ripping the hub out for all the power that you're gonna be putting down. Yeah, yeah. All right, so flex plate's one of the differences? Flex plate's one of the differences. Right. Moving on, um, we're gonna show you one of the things that we, that are the, a, a big difference to the, to the, uh, the, the wild build yeah. is gonna be these billet main caps. You can see behind me. Yeah. And we're running those right now. Um, so I'll kind of show you what that starts life as. Um, again, it's a solid piece of billet material. Yeah. Right? So this is what start and the finished product looks like. Right? So what this is going to do for us, instead of a factory main cap, I'm going to reach over here and grab this factory main cap. And this is a casket. And this is what would be on Evan's build versus what? That's right. Yep. Okay. So this is going to... Uh, not allow the the fretting that takes place with the um, loading of the crankshaft now that's great that we've got to build a main cap but what we want to do is we want to cinch that bottom end together so that it doesn't move in order to do that we actually manufacture this all this stuff in house this is a girdle that'll go on the bottom uh, of the engine and cinch in the main caps as well so this will actually get modified we have two different modification processes that we use uh, for the billet main cap um, we have guys that if they just want to purchase this product, uh, they can purchase it just like it is and it'll bolt on. They'll need to line bore their engine. Um, but if you want to use the girdle with it, three eighths of an inch come off the top of it. Whoa. I wanted to ask quick, is the girdle just for the wild build? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it is. It's for the guys that are pushing a thousand plus horsepower. Okay. Um, you really need that when you start putting down a lot of power. You don't want it to beat the bearings out and you certainly don't want it to start fretting. Yeah. Uh, so the girdle, definitely helps cinch everything together. Uh, it gives it structural rigidity to the bottom of that block, yeah. which is impaired for the higher horsepower numbers. Right. Now we've got a set of pistons up here that they belong to a 6.4, uh, but nonetheless, the process is the same. And this is gonna go for um, the wild build and the mild build. Um, there's two different models actually um, for the, your, your build uh, for the wild, or for, excuse me, for the mild. Um, we have a fly cut piston option of aluminum cast piston. Uh, now, there's a give and take on this thing. The give and take on it is that if you go with a cast aluminum piston, you can run a larger duration camshaft and uh, higher lift cam. So that's great. If you go with a second option, you, uh, you have a steel piston. And the steel piston will take a tremendous amount of abuse. However, because the ring land is so close to the top of that piston, uh, it will actually, it doesn't allow for any valve relief. Okay. So that's kind of the, the trade off on that. Yeah. On your build, uh, that's what we go with, with a steel piston. Uh, we do give those options. It all depends on the guy's uh, application. If he's gonna be on the street a whole lot, well then we'll choose you know, an application that gives me a little bit more lip. If he's a guy that's just strictly running the track, he's probably gonna melt this piston anyways then the steel piston's a better option. Right. You know? right. So the product that you're actually seeing on the screen is one of our latest developments uh, for the 6.7 Power Stroke. And this can go either on the mild build or the wild build. Uh, it's kind of a cool product, so that's the reason why I wanted to throw this in there. But that old pan is quite a bit different because it's not just a you know, cool uh, looking oil pan. It's yeah. aluminum and it's, you know, it's got heat dissipation. What makes it unique is, I don't know if you noticed the, the holes in the side of it. You got any idea what that might be for? Talking about kind of the wave of it there, the, the actual uh, hole in it. I'll pull it back up so that you can see it, but the uh, the oil, the, the holes in the side of that, that oil pan are actually for coolant passages. Okay. So what happens is the coolant runs through that oil cooler. What you see is, is it's entering uh, one portion of the, the oil pan and it flows through and there's end caps that are actually on that. Okay. So it does S curves through that to pick up any heat that it can off that oil and then it sends it back to the cooler. Um, and it really lends itself well because of the mounting and everything, the lo logistics, I guess you would say, of that engine. The oil cooler is right on the side, yeah. uh, so we're able to tap right into that, and it looks factory. Yeah. 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 So that's a cool little project that we've, we've developed. So, Cass, you want to talk about, you know, the alternative. If you didn't use that oil pan, yeah. you know, you said it's, it's better logistically. It's a little bit mm -hmm. more clean. You know, so, yeah, the advantage is that. If you left it factory, you know. Right. 
So the thing that we deal with is a lot of guys that are uh, hauling, you know, big heavy loads all the time, and their oil temperatures are always, anytime you're dealing with an engine, your enemy is heat, right? So anything we can do to get rid of that heat, um, but especially with the guys with the tow rigs. So a part like this helps us to dissipate and drives down those oil temperatures six to eight degrees. That's a big win um, for something that's already, you know, it's bolted on anyways. So if you want to step over here, we talked about line boring. Um, one of the processes that we do with uh, line boring is this Makino. And so we've built a fixture uh, that locates off of this block that's repeatable. Uh, we come in and we probe, we probe the, uh, the face of the block. You can see the billet main caps here. Yep. Um, we leave about 40 thousandths material and we'll come in and we'll actually line bore. Now there's something that's really key about this. Now we said that this is a part of your wild build, but keep in mind our machining processes for a mild build or a wild build many times are the exact same if they're going to give you an advantage. So the advantages is this. This block, when it came from the factory, they put the cam bearings in and they bore the cam bearings, okay? So if they bore the cam bearings, the aftermarket comes back, they drive cam bearings in that are already a way oversized, 10 thousandths. We measured and we did some testing, but they're about 10 thousandths over. When you compress them down, they, they shrink down to about 7 thousandths. So you've got 7 thousandths oil clearance. The problem with it is, is this cam tunnel has such a loose tolerance in it from the factory, they don't care because they're just going to drop the, they're going to drop the main, the, uh, the cam bearings in and they're going to line bore it. They're going to straighten it out when they do that. But what we found is, is that if we can tighten up those clearances and do it just like the factory did, use their cam bearings, install them in this block, and then line bore the cam bearing to fit the block, now we have oil clearances that are consistent. They're two thousands. But even if you try to open up this clearance, it's, a, it's like a snake and it's a tunnel. This thing is as crooked as a barrel of snakes. Yeah. So that's really key in maintaining good oil pressure because what we see on these engines are fuel economy is everything. So we see higher and higher. We see gear ratios now running 342, right? So you're running lower and lower RPMs, higher demand on that engine. And that's the reason why the new 2020 blocks came out with a variable uh, displacement pump because these things are running at 1500 RPM. They're loaded going up a hill and they're lugging. Yeah. So we need all the oil pressure that we possibly can get. Reducing that parasitic drag or draw off that is key to making this engine work. Yeah, very good. All right, let's go ahead and head over to the balancing section, yeah. and uh, we'll talk a little bit about the differences between the mild and the wild. Hey, Mr. Andy. Doing all right? Hey, buddy, how you doing? Doing good. great. Thanks for being with us on this. I oh, appreciate the opportunity. So what we've got going on today is a difference between, we've got two different builds, a mild build and a wild build for the 6.7 power stroke diesel engine. So I really want to talk a little bit about the differences um, as far as our strategy to make sure that this thing lives, doesn't twist beyond measure, and what we can do to address that on the CWT balancer. Sure. Well, the first thing you've got to understand about balancing is not so much about it as making power. The fact of the matter is you're looking for stability and durability. In other words, smoothness. Now, that's what gives you longevity. Now, making some power, though, is if it's radically out of balance, then it does ger generate a parasitic event that sort of robs power. But the key, the real key to all making these engines perform best is that everything works in harmony. And if it's not in harmony, it's in conflict. Pretty much figured out from there, things are gonna get bad quick. Absolutely. So, but cumulatively, we wanna think about this. Let's talk about the harmonic balancer for a minute. That's an integral part of the build. You gotta understand, it handles torsional dynamics. And when these things are built by the OE, they do a good job. But you're gonna take it from mild to wild. And you're making more power. The stock unit, it was never intended to do that. It's but more go. importantly, even the basic one, they once you install them, day one, drive off the showroom, they don't get better over time. It's not like wine. They go, they get bad. So when we're doing these units, especially on the, the wild side, you want to have a good damper. The fluid dampers work pretty well on diesel because of you're not having a normal combustion, you're detonating. And these things really work their butt off, right? So they won't get better. So we're talking about a differences on, for the guys watching, a difference between an RPM range uh, on, the, on the mild build, uh, somewhere in the range of uh, 3,000 to 4,000 RPM. For the wild build, uh, we're gonna see RPM upwards of 5,500. Sure. So what's our choice here and uh, what's our strategy for the wild build? 
What we actually do is we want to lower that tolerance a little bit better. Now, the gentleman who actually, your technician, who had balanced this one, he went a little over center on mild. But just to give you an example, he's got this thing about 1.3 grams here and half a gram here. Well, what that means, let me just show you something here. Is that in this particular case, I don't know if we can zoom in or not, but let's just simply say at 3,000 RPM, this is, came in at 147 pounds of unbalance. Now that was on the left side, but now we're down here at the same 3,000, we only have three pounds. That's a considerable difference. But what's important here is that it's doing it at 50 hertz. Now what that means is 50 times per second. So envision that we have this unit up here that had a 147 pound hammer, right? The other guy had what, a three pound hammer. I'm gonna put it right above my feet and I'm gonna let him go. Now Newton's law says they hit the ground at the same time, right? right. Which one hurt like hell? Right. The right one. Now think of that hammer hitting 50 times per second and you're driving down the road for hours. The bearing is the recipient of that load. Mm -hmm. It's just gonna simply surrender. Right. It's not gonna last over time. So that's one of the reasons. Now, when we get up to, in this particular case, the wild, we're moving up an RPM. So the force of unbalance increases with the square of RPM. Real quick, you're gonna pick up another couple hundred pounds of force just by elevating that RPM. Right. So you can see how important balance can be. Right. So we have a tolerance. It is a little bit lower on performance. Mm -hmm. Not a lot, but a little bit better. But it's a key that it's performed and it worked in harmony with the flywheel and the damper. Got it. So the wild build, for a recap, fluid dampener to absorb the first order of imbalance. Fourth, it's the multiple order, actually. Okay. And uh, for the mild build, we're going to stick with a harmonic balancer from the OE. Probably. And, and you know, let's be fair about it. If it's only gone 30,000 miles and a guy lost oil pressure, didn't change oil, blah, 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 you know, whatever, it's, it's not an engine that's already got 300,000 miles on it. Right. All right. So if it was a 300,000 mile engine though, I'd still replace it. Right. Okay. So always on, on all the engines that we're building, uh, we start with a new flywheel and a new harmonic balancer in everything. That's the only way to go. It's a wear item, right? It won't get better over time. That's Let's right. Let's get that clear. Absolutely. All right. All right, guys. So the next portion of the build is a block. Right. Um, so basically on the mild wild build, uh, there's a couple of different strategies that we're going to use on the wild side um, instead of the mild build. So one of the main things that we do that's a big difference between the wild, the wild build and the mild build uh, is the use of a sleeve. So this is a ductile iron sleeve with a flange on it. Right. So we use that. So once it's installed, it can't go anywhere. It's sandwiched between the head and the block. Uh, this hardness of this is about three times harder than a cast iron sleeve or a cast iron block would be. So we have a lot more longevity out of this. Um, one of the major things though that we also do, besides fully sleeving the wild build so that it'll hold a lot more horsepower, um, is that we use a single piece ring from Total Seal. Now the purpose of this is you're gonna be spraying a lot of fuel in this thing, right? Yeah. So to be able to make that 1,000, 1,200 horsepower, that's a lot of fuel going in the cylinder. It's not all gonna stay in the cylinder and it's not all gonna get burnt. Some of it's gonna wind up going to the crankcase. So what we need to do is make sure that that doesn't happen. And the total seal is the best option that we have available for that. Uh, so good ring sealing, more horsepower, less fuel dilution. The crankshaft's gonna live a long, happy life that way. Yeah. Very good. And obviously, you know, you've got some surfacing going on behind us with this machine. You also got the hone. Right. And both of those procedures are gonna be done on each of these boats too, right? Right, yeah. that's exactly right. Yeah. So one other thing that I didn't mention that you bring up a good point uh, is on the block, once it's decked and surfaced on the same operation, we O-ring it, okay? So the wild build is actually gonna get O-ringing not just in the cylinder head, but also in the block. Okay. Um, depending on the, the, the application, we'll use a fire ring, um, but a lot of the street builds that we're talking, even the higher performance builds, uh, we'll put an O-ring in the block and we'll put an O-ring in the head. That overlapping O-ring uh, basically creates kind of a cinch point for that gasket. So it bites into that MLS gasket uh, and it reduces any chances of blowing a head you know, head yeah, gasket. Right, right. And yeah. it's something the wild build gets, but the mild build right. doesn't quite need it at that horsepower level. Right, the mild build will get an O-ring in the cylinder head, which I'll show you in the head department when we okay. go. Um, so higher boost levels, you know, we guys got that are running these trucks up and down the road uh, for tow application purposes like that. 
you know, the 6.7 was a lot better platform in the fact that it had more six bolts actually per cylinder. Instead of its predecessor, the 6.4 and the 6 liter, they only had four bolts per cylinder head. Um, so the clamp load is a lot greater. We don't have to worry about blowing head gases like we would before, but to ensure that and to make sure that the guy does not have any problems, uh, proper ring sealing, we install on stainless steel wire in those cylinder heads. So that really uh, rectifies any uh, issues that might be yeah. down the road. Yeah. That's pretty cool fit for both builds. Right, yeah, a lot of value in that one, yeah. in, the, in the mild build. So Cass, the next thing would be honing um, the water we had over there. We yeah, we can go over to the yeah, hone department and check it out. So now we're in the hone department with my good friend Ed Keebler. Uh, so we have a mild build and a wild build, and they're very different in the way that we look at the strategy to get the correct cross hatching, surface finishing, and everything that's necessary for the longevity of the rings. And in order to make this happen, uh, we have two different approaches, uh, different honing uh, strategies that, uh, uh, that we approach this block. And I want Ed to kind of go over that and tell us a little bit about how to get that. Yeah, yeah, no problem. So really one of the biggest things is, 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 is the new values that we use to, to uh, determine surface finish. You know, once upon a time it was RA and, and everybody used RA and we really couldn't define a surface finish very well with RA. And, and with the new surface finish parameters, the RK values, RK, RPK, and RVK, we can better define a surface finish for honing or for the cylinder walls and, and uh, oil retention and, and ring sealing. And so um, we put a lot of emphasis on that, done a lot of studies, had a, had a lot of help from Total Seal and uh, some of the other ring manufacturers. And so we've really kind of settled on a, uh, on a pretty definitive uh, surface finish parameters, I'll say, um, you know, for both mild and wild bills, builds, excuse me. And uh, I noticed one of the other things, Cass, is, is you've got a six stone hone head. So the more abrasive you have in a hone head, the rounder the cylinder is. And, and geometry is a huge part of ring sealing. You know, these guys spend a lot of time uh, grinding rings or lapping rings round and then we make out around holes in the past and and uh, we try to seal perfectly round ring with an out around cylinder so um, with the six stone hone head you're going to get a much rounder uh, uh, cylinder and so the rings are going to just automatically seal better to start with but what we have found over the years is is that for a long time everybody thought the smoother the cylinder the better you were you know, uh, everybody was afraid of having some oil on the cylinder walls and that that would, uh, you know, migrate up to the top of the cylinder. And obviously wet, wet uh, top of the pistons aren't good for, for performance. And uh, over the years, you know, with the, with the new testing meth methods and, and some of the other things that we've come up with, we've determined that that's really just totally opposite of what everybody once thought. And so... We're really looking, especially on diesel builds or, or and, and the wild build where you're pouring just huge amounts of fuel into a cylinder and trying to you know, get them to ignite. Um, they tend to wash the oil off the cylinder walls and, and therefore you lose ring sealing and you get blow by and, and uh, you know, all kinds of other issues. And, and so, um, these RVK, the RK values really help us define that. And, and so what we're looking for is, is typically on what I would call a mild build, especially in the diesel world, because most all of them are turboed, I'm sure, correct? Oh yeah, absolutely. Uh, you're looking at anywhere from a 10 to 20 RPK, which is the peak count. That's what the ring actually sees. And then you're looking anywhere from I'd say probably 40 to 50 on your RVK, and that's the valleys. That's what the oil sees, or that's what holds the oil for you, helps you seal a cylinder. Um, and then the RK, you're, we're, we want to be in the 30 to 40 range, and that's kind of our plateau or our bearing load or bearing area that, that, that actually you know, takes most of the load of the ring. And then when we get into the wild build, we don't want to vary our, our PK at all. We're still 10 to 20. And, but what we want to see is, is we want to see more RVK. We want to see more valley because, again, you tend to have higher combustion chamber uh, pressures and, and uh, 
boost pressure. Tend, boost pressures, and you tend to pour more fuel into those, you know. So again, all of this sort of stuff is is trying to blow that oil off the cylinder walls, which helps us seal the rings. Right. And so you'll want, uh, you know, I got some guys we call wild diesel guys, the uh, crazy diesel guys that are wanting RBKs in the 150s. So it really does make a difference. We're finding that anywhere from the pro stock ranks to the crazy diesel guys, you know, that, that more RVK has uh, really awakened, I guess you'll, you'll say, uh, some, uh, most of us and opened some eyes up that, that uh, even on naturally aspirated, you know, with some uh, alcohol, you know, the, the sprint car engines. Those guys are wanting RBKs up to where you're probably wanting, wanting them for your wild diesel build. But it really does make a, a huge difference. We're seeing nice horsepower gains by doing that. So the reason why we wouldn't be running an RBK um, basically on an engine so and just set it at maybe a wild build where we're seeing 100 RBK or 80 RBK is it points that we start to tend to get into oil consumption issues at that point in time? Yeah, yeah, you know, because you're, again, you're not, you, the, the oil will, will set up there, you know. Otherwise, when you get into the wild stuff with the high compressions and, and uh, uh, lots of fuel, you're, you're trying to wash that oil off. So for the guys that are listening, I think if you're a, a machinist maybe, uh, if you've ever hold it, held a bolt in your hand, the major diameter versus the minor diameter, I guess the major diameter of a bolt, that might be considered the RVK, right? That's where the threads are. The R or the RPK, the RVK would be the minor the diameter. The minor side, right? correct. And maybe your pitch diameter would be the RK, that that's in the middle. Yeah. All right, well, I greatly appreciate that. Yeah, that's yeah. And very, then, uh, you know, as far as your, your uh, cross-hatch angles, you know, I mean, we tend to, that tends to determine, or really your cylinder length is kind of determines your cross-hatch angle. Shorter your cylinder length or your stroke, kind of the shallower your cross-hatch angle. So, you know, we tend to run anywhere from about a 28 degree on the pro stock stuff, the, the really short stroke stuff, up to 45, 50 degrees on, on some of your stuff. So. Yeah especially like this Cummins block right. with a really long cylinder wall, yep. right? Yeah. Well, I greatly appreciate that. That's yeah. very insightful and great information for us machinists out there, so. Yeah, glad yeah. to help anyway. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. So now we're gonna go ahead and head on over to the cylinder head department and uh, look and see what the differences are on the mild and wild builds over there. All right, so this is a head department. Um, if you haven't figured that out yet. Yeah, right. So this is our 6.7 power stroke. Um, in the background, we've got Red over here, and he's going to be uh, surfacing some heads. We're talking about the mild build versus the wild build. Um, and these are the O-rings that we were talking about earlier in the block department yeah. uh, that every cylinder head gets for mild or wild. And so one of the main things that are different between the two is the spring choice that we use for the valves. Also a difference in, in the valves as well. but. Uh, the spring choice is extremely critical because these guys that are running a whole lot uh, larger turbochargers and a lot more boost pressure uh, tend to float those valves. And that's a really big problem on the exhaust stroke. Keeping them apart is keeping them happy. Um, exhaust back pressure. Obviously, if it's a compound setup where we're feeding a small charger, we tend to have more exhaust back pressure than a big, one big single. Yeah. So that's going to completely change our, our setup. So we always want to ask the customer, what type of turbocharger application and match spring pressure and in conjunction with that, yeah. just no different than you would like matching a torque converter with a, with the right uh, turbocharger. Right, right, absolutely. All right, and then uh, obviously there's gonna be some differences in the heads themselves with right. the, the wild build and then the mild build. You wanna talk a little bit about yeah. what so, kind of goes into it from the start? Sure, so one of the things that we are, are looking to do is to scavenge as much air across that cylinder as we possibly can so we do that by porting. The problem with the six liter, or excuse me, the problem with the six seven head uh, is that this is a reverse flow engine, right? So typically, conventionally, like a 350 Chevrolet or six liter, seven three or Cummins or whatever, uh, your exhaust would typically be on the outside of the engine um, and your, your intakes are on the inside. Well, on a six seven, it's just the opposite. So the valve cover is the intake itself. So your intake is actually running from the outside to the inside uh, obviously into the cylinder, and then the exhaust goes from the inside through the turbocharger, the exhaust, uh, uh, the up pipe, and then it circulates that way. It helps a lot in spooling, but it really creates one big problem. 
Um, as you can see on the cylinder head, there's this large intake runner. And the biggest issue that you find with that is, is the inability to open that up or to port that. We can definitely do some port work on the exhaust uh, and clean that bowl up and help that air uh, escape. But we're very limited in what we're able to do uh, on the intake side. Unless we go with a full-blown billet aluminum head, that's not a street application. For today's purposes and what we're talking about, they're two very streetable engines, um, mild and wild, but still they can be driven you know, right. on the street. Absolutely. All right, and Cass, I think you mentioned that the springs are gonna differ a little bit. How about some of the other valve train components and like do the valves themselves differ between the two builds? So we wanna talk about valves a little bit too and the differences in those builds. Um, obviously the diameter of the valve can be increased because uh, we're not limited with uh, the scope of the bore and the placement of the valve. Uh, the bore diameter of this is a three inch 896 on the six sevens. It still leaves us enough room that we can actually open that up uh, with a larger diameter valve. So. Um, we're working on developing some products too with SBI for some aftermarket valves. Um, so there's some upgrades in the future for, for these guys. Very cool. Very cool. Cass, anything else about the heads or just the differences between, you know, what I would get for my budget versus what Evan's getting on the, on the mild side? Well, to do a recap on it, we've got some port work that's done on the exhaust. Uh, we've got larger springs, so stiffer springs is going to allow us to run a lot larger turbocharger. Um, it's also going to give us the capability to run a compound setup, not worry about the valve float. Um, and then obviously, like we said, larger diameter valve. So that's a good roundabout, uh, all in all, um, quite a bit of value for the guys and score one for the wild guys right there. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. And yeah, the cylinder heads are important, so we'll take it. <laughs> so now there's not a whole lot else that we haven't touched on yet. So. You know, let's, uh, let's go talk about the complete build and just kind of a recap of what goes into each of these. Absolutely. All right, let's go to assembly. You've shown us around, taken all the different engine stations, got a layout of what this build's kind of going to look like. And as far as the mild build, we're kind of speaking more on reliability here, right? right. How much horsepower are we going to be making with this engine about? Okay, so the mild build, you're looking around 600, 650-ish, okay? Um, to kind of give you an idea of some of the things that are going to go into it, uh, we can show you that on the cart that we've got here. Uh, but for a guy that's doing the tow work, construction, rancher, hot shotter, guy that's really beating on the truck day in and day out, just working the truck, but not the drag strip guy. Right. This is a build for him. And you know, on the table here, you got the 2020 Carrillo rods. This will go into the mild build. Right. Now this is a factory rod, but the difference is, is we make two different um, engine builds for the mild and milder build. Mm -hmm. uh, what we refer to as the daily driver, which is a guy that is going to use this the way that Ford intended for him to use, but wants it better than what Ford built it. Then we have the mild build, which we consider the workhorse. So we have the daily driver, uh, and then we have the workhorse. So that's the next step up. Um, and with that workhorse, you're going to get a different connecting rod. Even though it's a factory rod, uh, it ends up being a much stouter rod than what they did in 11 to 16. So if you had an 11 to 16 year model truck, you wanted to upgrade that rod for a workhorse build, it'll actually come with a different piston that we talked about earlier. Um, instead of the cast piston, uh, that we have here on the table with this rod, this connecting rod here, um, you can actually see the difference between the connecting rods. There's a lot larger cross-sectional area. Mm -hmm. And this aluminum piston um, gets traded out for a much beefier steel piston uh, that you see here. So that's a big step up and a big advantage over the mild build versus a, cons a factory reman or um, just a uh, 11 to 16 shock replacement. And you know, we, we talked a lot about durability and how important that is for a build like this. Is this something somebody could take out on the weekends and run around a little bit or is it strictly workhorse? Oh no, uh, this is built for the guy that um, uh, wants to, to play on the weekends as well. Um, the connecting rods are the limiting factor on this build. Um, to a certain extent, 600 horsepower, 650-ish, that's where the connecting rods uh, that's where they'll leave the chat at that we found. So, and you know, after the engine's all done, we're, we're talking, you know, what kind of turbocharger would you put on an engine like this? Right. The oiling system. Right. So it depends on the guy's application. Uh, a 64 and a half millimeter charger 
um, compressor size. That's that's most of the guys that are doing what we're doing. It still gives a good uh, ability to to spool. Um, it still gives um, a good enough airflow that we see. It makes the power, lowers the EGT levels. It's a really good, really good drivability for that charger. Mm -hmm. And just to quickly recap, we we talked about all the machining processes already, but. Just the key differences in uh, you know honing boring between the mild build and the wild build. Yeah, there's a tremendous amount of difference. It's funny because you know you look at something and you think maybe that there's a different part that needs to be added, but it needs to be customized, right? Particular to the application. A lot of people ask me, well, do I need this or do I need that? You know, if it's a stage two, is a stage three better? If it's a stage three, is a stage four better? It all depends on the application. Mm -hmm. So the machining process uh, is catered to. Uh, whatever application the person's doing. Like we learned in the home department, the difference in that RVK is really what makes the difference on the ring life that is so crucial for longevity. Uh, the difference is in the balancing department and some of the components that we're selecting, but also um, a lot of differences in a ring with a, with a block. Uh, we're seeing a difference there. Uh, we're definitely seeing the, the big difference though is that billet main cap, the girdle, and the line boring that takes place there. So those are things that are a lot different than what the mild build would actually get. And 600 horsepower is kind of the number we kept throwing around, but say I were to decide to upgrade later, how easy would it be on this platform to upgrade and make some more power? Well, unfortunately, I mean, obviously we, we can bolt on parts and make more power. Uh, it's not so much about how much power you make because truly the engine doesn't make power in and of itself. Mm -hmm. It's the combustion events that take place uh, that actually make and produce the power it's how much power we can actually hold. Right. So at 600 horsepower, your weakest link, your next fuse, you know, yes, you can put a bigger circuit breaker in, but at some point in time, you're gonna burn your house down. So, you know, people go, well, how much more amperage could I pull out of that thing? Well, you can, you know, you can hook 10 dryers to it or 10 stoves to it, but eventually it's gonna overload the wiring. And unfortunately the wiring, that's your connecting rods. So that's gonna be the weak link. Right. Well, Cass, we got a great engine here. I'm excited to see the end result. Thanks again for uh, walking us through it. Yeah. I'm going to go grab Greg, and he's going to come talk about that wild build. Sounds great. All right, Cass, so you just wrapped up the overview of the mild build, but uh, we're here to talk about the wild build, you know, right. the, the, really, the really cool high horsepower engine, which you guys lovingly call the Cass Squatch, which is right. uh, a cool name. Uh, it's for the big-footed drivers. <laughs> there you go. Got to have the big foot, right? So walk us through, just kind of a recap of what all goes into that wild build, because it's a lot of stuff. It really is. Um, so I like to start geographically. So we just start from the bottom of the engine up. Um, so starting out, we talked about the billet main caps that are machined, all right? So it's made out of a solid billet instead of the cast iron main cap. Uh, we, we talked about the differences between it and uh, allowing for fretting for a cast iron cap. Uh, on top of that, we also had the girdle that cinches everything together, right? So extremely important there. We're really trying, like anything else, start with a good foundation, you'll end with a good result. Yep. Uh, so that's the big thing that we're really, we're shooting for there. Yep. Moving up from there, um, obviously we, the differences both come with the billet flex plate, so we still have to, uh, you know, that's kind of a wash there. Mm -hmm. The difference is the, is the damper. Uh, we talked about that in the balancing department yep. uh, to be able to handle some of the torsional loads. Right. Uh, so anyways, that's again, a difference there with the, um, uh, with the wild build. Yeah, because they're, they're both still a stock crank. So right. A little bit, like you said, difference in the balancing and then obviously the damper there. Yep. Yeah, and we TIG well both. Um, obviously, it's a very problem, a very large problem uh, for the 6 7 guys with spinning the gear, especially when you start adding more spring tension. It's a press fit, so that gear tends to spin. Uh, so we TIG that to make sure that that's not going to be an issue yep. later on. Yeah. Right. So moving up from there, connecting rods, that's the big deal, right? That's yep. where a lot of money gets spent. Yep. Yeah, your, ro your rotating assembly, a couple of differences, right? Right. We can definitely put a lot more power uh, for air and fuel, uh, but if we don't have a way to hold it, connecting rods are the mechanical link. Yep. And uh, that's, uh, you know, we discussed um, on the wild build, or excuse me, on the mild build, the difference there with um, how much more power. That was really what was going to be his threshold. That was what the cutoff point was. And unfortunately, on a mild build, it's not like somebody just throwing another set of injectors. Um, or another turbocharger or something like that. Yep. Um, but once you do it, you're stuck with it, right? Yeah. So that's a deciding factor. The rods, uh, that being said, we also talked about the pistons. Um, you know, again, there's a couple of different options there. Yep. Camshaft, depending on those, 
uh, options that you have available. Um, it depends on what you're going to be doing with that. We can definitely move more airflow through that cylinder head. Um, so there's that. Um, one of the main differences now I'll add to um, also, and I meant to add this, and I totally forgot about this. So please, ex yeah. please excuse me on this. The 2020 cylinder heads is what we do mostly on the cask watch. Okay. Now, the reason for that is they do flow more air. It also comes with a custom up pipe um, that we use for that as well uh, because the exhaust manifolds don't bolt up the same. Okay. So you can take and drop in a 2015 with our up pipe kit that we have there. Um, but I totally left that out and I apologize. But, yeah. uh, so moving up from there, we talked about spring, tension, uh, seat pressures, um, and the upgrades that we saw there. Not just the camshaft that we talked about. Also in the valve train component area, Jessel valve train, we use a rocker assembly from them uh, versus a stock. On the wild, on the mild build, um, we do upgrade to the later version part number uh, from Ford on that build. Uh, but this calls for a different valve train setup. Obviously, both are coming with chromoly push rods. Um, the difference is in the head studs. So one's running a 625 head stud. Um, and the other is going to run uh, basically a um, standard uh, head stud there. Another one gets main studs as well. Obviously, when we're going to the billet main caps, uh, we're needing something more than just a stock bolt. Right. Right. So yep. we're talking factory uh, main bolts on that versus the yeah. head. Yeah, like I said, everything's just a little bit beefier on the wild side. So. Right. Okay. Yeah. Uh, there you go. Uh, ARP equipment on the uh, flange bolts for the, um, uh, for the flywheel. So that's going to be different. Um, so there's there's quite a bit of things to keep in, in your mind. We talked about the O-ring. Uh, yeah. there's, there's a lot of differences, but there's a lot of value in both. Yeah, absolutely. All right, so Cass, again, both builds are really solid builds, and you're getting a lot for the money on either side. Um, but specifically with that wild build that, that I'm talking about with you, the Cass Squatch, you know, how much horsepower am, am I going to be able to get out of that um, combination? Yeah, so that typically... Um, there's still a lot left to be said for that. Uh, 1,200 horsepower is, we've got guys that are running more than that, upwards to 1,500 horsepower. Yeah. Uh, but typically when the guys that are looking for that at that point, it's not, you know, an 800 horsepower vehicle is almost not straightable. Right. You know? So you don't see a lot of these come through the shop as many, you know, it's pretty, it's, it's a certain uh, customer that's looking yep. for that. Yep. Uh, but 1,200 plus horsepower for that. Okay. Basically half, 50% is what you're, what you're giving up because yeah. of the connecting rods on the mile build. Yeah, absolutely. And like you said, uh, you know, you're getting into those high horsepower levels. What kind of durability do you have with an engine like that? You know, is it still a durable package, um, something that's reliable? Yeah, well, you know, spell warranty, spell performance. Yep. You know, they don't spell the same. Um, there's a lot of difference there. It all depends on the setup. Uh, a lot of the problems that we see could be changed Running a big single charger is easy on your rotational assembly. It really is because higher RPMs that we're dealing with, uh, we have low, lower distress on the ro reciprocating mass because of the amount of time uh, that really takes place for the combustion event. If you're spinning at a higher RPM, you have higher engine speed. Uh, you tend not to stress the lower components like the, the, the connecting rods and things like that. Yeah. So really that horsepower is a really difficult number because basically the things that cause us to destroy parts are you know, heat and pressure. And yeah. it just depends. There's a lot of different ways to make horsepower. It all depends on how you're making it, where you're making it. Right. So. Okay. Very good. And then, uh, you know, Evan was talking with you about being able to upgrade his mild build later on. And, you know, there's kind of, kind of a threshold there um, before you just start breaking parts um, and, and needing to go to that next level. Whereas I'm already at that next level. So, mm -hmm. Is it, is it easier for me to upgrade this package later on and, and get more out of it? Or oh, yeah. is there still that big barrier with this build? Yeah, for sure. You're a lot easier to upgrade simply because all the bottom end work's been done. Yep. If you were going to do anything like, let's say you wanted to go to a billet head, right? Uh, and we wanted to go to you know, a ductile uh, puck basically for the cylinder. Yeah. We could do a billet head and we could get all that done without ever having to take the engine out of the truck. Um, way easier at his point. Right now, he's at the stage where that engine's coming back apart. Connecting rods are going in. Yep. So. Yep. Okay. Very good. Well, Cass, again, really appreciate your time for showing us through the shop, and telling us about both the Smile build and the Wild build on the 6.7 Power Stroke platform. And uh, 
we're excited to, to get these done and uh, see kind of who gets the most bang for their buck. So again, we really appreciate the time. Well, thanks for y'all uh, coming in today. We enjoyed it and uh, Absolutely. looking forward to it. Man. Absolutely. Well, Bye. thank you, Cass. All right, guys, well, you just got to see the process kind of A to Z of what goes into one of these six, seven power stroke engines here at Choate Engineering Performance. Uh, Cass did a great job walking us through everything that goes into it, whether you got the mild uh, budget or you got the wild budget. But now it's time for Evan and I to discuss kind of who got the more most bang for their buck here on these builds. So we're going to talk through these builds, uh, break them down by total horsepower, uh, dollars per horsepower, competitiveness, drivability, durability, and then ease of upgrading. So let's start with the obvious one, Evan, that's total horsepower, and that's gonna go to the wild build. You know, I'm able to get, you know, somewhere between 1,200 and 1,500 horsepower, uh, whereas you're getting about 600 horsepower uh, on the mild side. And so wild's gonna take the, the check mark there. Uh, moving to uh, dollars per horsepower, or horsepower per dollar, sorry. Uh, we're pretty even there, because uh, you know I've got a $30,000 budget getting about 1,200 horsepower. He's got a $15,000 budget getting 600 horsepower, so it's both about $25 per horsepower. However, because I've got a little bit more of a range of horsepower, you know, being able to go from 1,200 up to 1,500, depending on you know, what kind of injectors I might run or the turbo combination I run. Uh, that gives the nod to the wild build there because that up to 1500 horsepower, that's about $20 per horsepower in that range. So right now it's two to zero uh, towards the wild build, getting a little more bang for the buck. The wild build, you have that upgrade ability, but as far as the mild build, you may only have 600 horsepower, but you have, you know, much better durability this is an engine that's going into, you know, a shop truck or a workhorse, something a guy is going to be using for, you know, a good amount of years without having to do a ton of, you know, upgrading, reinstalling points, reinstalling parts. It just has that extra reliability to it. Yeah, definitely. You, you got a pretty durable piece. Uh, the durability level on my build is definitely solid, but to your point, you got all that horsepower. There's definitely a higher chance of me breaking something uh, or needing to go to the next level for something. Um, so that's the check mark for the mild build. Uh, similarly on drivability, uh, you know, you just got uh, a little bit easier time. It's more streetable overall, being at 600 horsepower. You're not going to really push the limits there uh, in any regard, but you know, it's still enough to take out on the weekend and take on the strip if you really want to do do that. Yep. Uh, obviously not competing at a super high level, but you know, you can still have your fun with it. Yeah. All right. So. The mild gets uh, drivability as well as durability. Uh, so right now it's two to two. Let's talk about competitiveness. Um, now, neither of these builds are competition level builds. You know, let's, we're, not, we're not pretending that they are, but like Evan said, you might wanna take each of, these, uh, each of these builds out to the track, have a little fun on the weekend. And uh, there again, because of the horsepower difference, uh, the wild build's going to be more competitive. It's going to get you faster times out there uh, going down the drag strip uh, than the mild build will. So check mark for the wild build there. All right, so that leaves us with just the ease of upgradability. Uh, Evan, do you want to talk a little bit about that on the mild side? Yeah, so for the mild build, you know, again, we're at that 600 horsepower limit. And that's kind of, as Kat said, as high as you can go in that regard for, you know, what components and parts you're using. If you upgrade it past that point, start bolting on stuff that's going to add more power, you're, you're really risking hurting the engine, you know, something catastrophic might happen there. So as far as ease of upgradability, it's not something you're going to look to do too far with, you know, the mild build, but in Greg's case, that's something you can start looking at. Yeah, so again, like we discussed a little bit, I've got more wiggle room on that horsepower level, anywhere from 1,200 to 1,500 horsepower totally capable with the components and the foundation there with the billet mains and the girdle. Um, and if I wanted to go above that, it's really just a simple swap of uh, maybe putting some billet heads on it or doing some different things where uh, you're not having to redo that entire combination. It's just uh, a couple, you know, upgraded uh, parts and then you've got a significantly better engine. So 
the wild build's gonna take that uh, category as well. And by my count, that's a four to two victory for wild build here uh, on today's episode. Still both great engines, you know. Absolutely. Anybody would be happy with either package. Absolutely. Uh, so again, guys, we hope you appreciated uh, checking out this episode of Mild vs. Wild. Uh, we showcased the six, seven liter power stroke platform to show you a little bit about what you're gonna get on that mild budget and what you're gonna get on the wild budget. And uh, we hope you guys enjoyed it. Make sure you're checking out Choate Engineering Performance and everything that they've got going on. Awesome shop, as you saw. And as always, make sure you're checking out enginebuildermag.com for more engine content. We appreciate you watching, and we'll see you next time. Thanks, guys.